Hello, I'm Daniel Holmesy, Director of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network here for the City and County of San Francisco. Over my shoulder, you can see our City Hall, where today we're gonna to be hosting the first ever NEN Disaster Resilience Summit with the theme of building a resilient future one neighborhood at a time. It's gonna be an amazing day. We're gonna have folks join us like Mayor Ed Lee, who's gonna talk about why he is so committed to this important work happening in our neighborhoods, as well as City Administrator Naomi Kelly, who every day is stewarding a myriad of important projects that are advancing our resilience at all levels. We'll get a chance to hear from Council Member Latoya Cantrell, who personally led the recovery from her neighborhood in New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina. And then I'll get a chance to update the community on the brand new Empower Communities program, which we've been testing in neighborhoods for the last seven years. Also, Patrick Cotolini, the Chief Resilience Officer for the City and County of San Francisco, will be sharing the vision he has for creating a strategic plan for the city. And then lastly, we're all gonna to come together in a whole suite of important workshops on how we can train and empower our communities to provide mission critical services to them and especially the vulnerable residents after times of stress. So it's gonna be an amazing day. Let's not delay, let's jump in and see how it's going. appreciate all of you stretching to come out here uh, this morning and, and spending time here at the first ever Neighborhood Empowerment Network Disaster Resilience Summit. Um, and it's really an honor to be here uh, for seven years. A lot of you have uh, tolerated my passion, enthusiasm, and desire to do something about this important issue. And it's just so great that every year uh, more and more of you are coming together around this opportunity. Communities truly are uh, the, the, the people they look around and they can see as they walk out their front door the ones that they can rely on really to be there right now uh, for, the short, for the short term and then into the long term recovery. Two of my favorite activities hands down are attending these Resilient, Resilientville uh, activities. I've been to several workshops with Neighborhood Empowerment Network and of course attending the citywide drills for San Francisco NERD. Love both of those programs. And we have got some partners here. We've seen Team Rubicon for a few years now. Uh, this last year was really groovy. Um, you know, Daniel and I have had a whole community workshop for a couple years. We've co-hosted, and we had it here in the city at Next Door in Zynga. So we're happy to get businesses involved. Again, uh, organizations like Team Rubicon, City of San Francisco. And so I'm excited to be here today, uh, looking to take these programs you have in San Francisco, frankly, and take them as benchmark programs around my region to Los Angeles, Phoenix, Honolulu, wherever. I, I may go. So this partnership really exemplifies the university's commitment to becoming and to, I think, confirming its status as the city's university. Um, the, through this partnership, our students have been able to work with um, the city to learn and con learn from and contribute to its incredibly innovative work in program development, documentation, and assessment. Um, but for our purposes, we're also thrilled that this gives our students an access to a unique form of experiential learning. So that while they are experiencing the benefits of giving and contributing their efforts to the city, they're also able to take away, I think, a sense of deep commitment that comes from doing meaningful work with community partners. So for us, this project uh, really represents what the university is all about. We went back into our future, and then Mayor Newsom said, Ed, you and Daniel go over there and you find out what happened. You find out what a city did not do so that we can learn from them. And of course, we brought everything from lawnmower tools to our good sense of volunteerism to other donations that we can possibly do to help out the Broadmoor community that Latoya is gonna talk a lot more about. But in registering our city's official support, we were also there to really redefine our San Francisco's future. Because we know in a matter of years and not decades, we have our own challenge. And we brought back from the future lessons learned, many, many deep, heartfelt lessons from community leaders, from 
business leaders, from government leaders, so that we could learn for ourselves. During those years, Batoya and I had a big relationship with Harvard University. We wanted an educational aspect, uh, an intelligence, uh, more than what we study, a, a professional study. And now that we have SF State, that's our partner, that continues that, that very needed uh, academic approach to what we're doing so that we cover as much as possible. We also made a promise in coming back from the future we wouldn't wait for the disaster to call upon FEMA. So I'm really glad to see Randy here because it's always been a mantra. We need FEMA here right now before the events happen so that we're not responding to what I call the Formica approach uh, to disaster response so much as having FEMA here to figure out everything from having maybe block grant approaches to uh, raising our community afterwards. But most importantly, the lesson that we learned, that we brought back, that now is so deeply reflected in our city administrator's work right now, and our education work, and our work with FEMA, is that we need all of our agencies to work with our communities, to have our communities better prepared. That is the biggest lesson. Team Rubicon is a nonprofit organization that was founded about six years ago. Uh, we were founded on the premise that we could take the skills and experiences of military veterans coming back from Iraq and Afghanistan and take those skills and experiences and use them for disaster response work, both here in the United States and around the world. And over the course of the last six years, we've recruited almost 33,000 veterans into that cause, and we've responded to nearly 130 disasters, both around the United States and in places like Nepal and Haiti in the Philippines. And our mission is twofold. Not only do we think that those veterans can bring a specific and valuable skill set to disaster response, but we know both anecdotally and empirically that this opportunity to find a new mission as civilians can provide for those military veterans the things that they are missing and seeking as they transition from the military. Those things are a sense of purpose, a sense of community, and a sense of identity that can help them be better civilians after their time in uniform. I think most recently it was 1989 Loma Prieta that, uh, for those of you that were living here at the time, sort of rang the bell once again for us. It had been a number of years after the 1906 earthquake, but in 1989, the Loma Prieta earthquake, uh, it was about four months before I came into the department. I entered in April of 1990. But what it signaled to us as San Franciscans is that we have, we have a community that is very interested in giving back and in participating. And in the San Francisco Fire Department, there were so many people in our community that wanted to work shoulder to shoulder with us. And the one thing that we found out, we made it work, but the one thing that we found out and owned as a fire department is that we have so many willing people, but we need to coordinate and organize them in a, in a fashion so that uh, the recovery phase can come that much more quickly. This, for me personally, I started my career in 1996 in the Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services. And we, we knew we were the boots on the ground on what each community in San Francisco distinctly needed and what were their concerns. And neighborhood, the Neighborhood Empowerment Network is continuing with that legacy, working with the current Mayor's Office of Neighborhood Services and all other organizations to make sure that we are essential because if there is a big catastrophe, government may not be able to get to you for 72 hours. And how do us as a community in our own personal communities work together to make sure that we are all safe, that we are providing for one another, and that we can take care of ourselves until government can get there. With Resilient Bayview, we formed our vulnerable population group, which identifies seniors, persons living with disability, pregnant women, um, and then we've also began to map out our assets, not so much only the human mm -hmm 
the human lives, but the assets as to how and what and where we can be, begin rebuilding as a community. We not only want to be resilient in our community, we want for our city officials and resilient Bayview to look at us and be able to call on us to be able to help the city. And I know that yesterday we spoke communication around agency officials as well as what's happening on the ground in your community becomes a big issue. Can you speak a little bit about communication? Right, well, and, and on the first, um, I think the first step when we talk about communication is, again, communication within, within the community within that neighborhood, within that area, how you as residents are gonna be communicating with one another. Because again, you are your first responders, period. We've created something called the Empower Communities Program. In a nutshell, it coordinates the deployment of the resources and expertise of the members of the Neighborhood Empowerment Network in support of the community's pursuit of resilience. So I know a lot of words right there, but the bottom line is we take a servant leadership approach towards this work. In other words, we plan with people, not for them. After CAPS was, was uh, finalized uh, towards the end of, end of uh, uh, 2010, it ultimately came up with 17 key policy recommendations that were then turned into this plan next to it, the 30-year earthquake safety implementation program, which you heard our city administrator mention this morning. Um, this breaks that down into 50 real tasks. It makes it really simple. Uh, I've been with the city for about three years now, and I jokingly say that I was the only person that got to start with an instruction manual. So as long as I'm going down that list, things to, seem to be going pretty well. This is the portion that hopefully you've all been waiting for, which is the part where you get to like reflect back to us, right? So hopefully we've given you enough uh, inspiration and narrative and statistics to be all fired up. And now we want to actually capture it. These people would not be uh, trying to blow dry their hair after a disaster. They would be focusing on things that are really needed. As we're sitting here at our table here discussing the opportunities to feed communities, the most important thing we're all seeing is the need for everybody within the communities to start talking now. That's a big part of the social capital and community resilience is knowing your neighbors, knowing who needs what. It means a great deal to me to think that I can actually now help create within my own neighborhood of 2,000 households uh, uh, an organic and self-created collective of energy to plan for what we're going to do when things go so terribly amiss. My biggest takeaway is the coordination from the city planning and organizations with like the Red Cross and community groups in how do we come together because we're looking at facilities. And if it is feeding and if you are the feeder then make sure your people know how to handle food safely in a disaster environment which has contamination issues and already has health issues. At the end of the day, you know, I think it's pretty eye opening to walk around to the different breakout groups and hear how people are uh, brainstorming for the first time through some of these problems that they maybe have never thought about before. I am just so encouraged by the grassroots organizing and efforts here in the city of San Francisco. The neighborhood participation is phenomenal, but more importantly that people are committed to planning for themselves, identifying their assets in their community, understanding that they are the world's greatest experts on their neighborhood, and they're taking ownership of how they're going to ensure their neighborhood recovers, but more importantly, how they become first responders in a post-disaster environment. If you'd like to learn more about the Neighborhood Empowerment Network and programs such as the Empower Communities Program, as well as about all the amazing partners that we have working together every day to build a more resilient future for our communities, visit EmpowerSF.org. Sign up for our newsletter and stay in touch.